church does belong to Baptists. They make the rules for it. They call it their pastor's church. They call it their church. But in the New Testament, the church that you read about belongs to God, belongs to His Son, and they make the rules for it. You have heard of my conversation in the time past. Jews' religion contrasted with the church of God. Look what he said. Galatians 1.23, he goes on to say, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in time past now preacheth the faith which he once destroyed. The faith, the word of God, faith comes by hearing the word of God, the faith that he preached actually contains the true church of God or the church of Christ. It does not contain any of these denominations that you hear about. Now, I'm going to go ahead and take calls as we go along, so I don't know if that call is actually for us or if it's for someone else. We don't have the phone lines up, but we can put them up. So this is what we've been discussing in the last couple of days. Now remember, I actually, what I was referring to in that phone call a moment ago with that gentleman, is that for me, Tyler? Uh, that gentleman was trying to uh, produce a verse. You know what the Bible say? Yes, caller. Yes, you're still an idiot. Okay, I'm still an idiot. I was a weasel the other day. Thanks for calling. All right, I, I was a weasel the other day. Now I've, uh, what have I done? Have I gone up or gone down? I'm an idiot today. So anyway... Uh, even though I'm an idiot, I have sense enough to know that in the New Testament, Jesus, God, nor none of the apostles commanded anyone to tithe. That's the Jews' religion. Now notice, friends, you know what's causing the persons to have aggravation and agitation towards me? It's not me. It's not the suit I'm wearing tonight. It's not aggravating and agitating you. It's not my hairdo. It's not these glasses I wear. What it is is this line stays empty. The denominations out there who have been beating you over the head with the tithe all these years do not have a verse, and we're demonstrating that. Now, isn't that a good thing? Galatians 4.16, the Apostle Paul said, Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Am I an idiot because I'm telling you the truth? Am I a weasel because I tell you the truth? Am I the devil, as some people say, because I'm telling you the truth? What's the problem here? Is it the case that you want to do what God wants you to do or not? So this verse, this line is still empty. $1,000 for any denominational preacher that gets up every Sunday and, and tells you you're robbing God that can show you where, in fact, New Testament church worship involves the tithe. That's the Jews' religion. Here it is. I'm reading it right here, Deuteronomy 12, 5 and 6. But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all the tribes to put his name there. That's 1 Kings 8, Jerusalem. Even unto his habitation shall thou seek. Thither thou shalt come. What are you going to do there? There shall you bring your burnt offering, your sacrifice, your tithes, your heave offering of your hand and your, view, and your vows, your free will offerings, the first thing of your herds and of your flocks. That is the Jews' religion. If you're going to do this tithing business, you need to take it to Jerusalem. If you're not going to take it to Jerusalem, then you're guilty of all the law. Isn't that what James chapter 2 says? If you are not going to keep, if you're going to claim to be under the law, then you're obligated to keep all of the law. And I know people are not keeping all of the law. They don't even think they're keeping the law at all. I hear that all the time. People tell me you're not under the law. So he says, um, let's see, James chapter 2, verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. So if you're over here thinking that you're tithing, you must be keeping the law. That's the Jews' religion. Okay, that's what we did two weeks ago. Now last week, we, we ended up showing how that people are using the Jews' religion to get their praise. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 6. And the priests waited on their office, the Levites also, the instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to praise the Lord. I'm not denying that David was using these mechanical instruments of music, but that's the Jews' religion. David was tithing also. But we're in the New Testament church. You know what's the Bible say? Hello, are you going to have a bath in your uh, tent? Excuse me? Are you going to baptize in your tent? We will have uh, a baptistry available, yes. So you will baptize those that come and uh, receive Christ? You don't receive Christ, sir, until you are baptized. You a hypocrite. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm getting better. I was an idiot. I was a weasel. Now I'm a hypocrite. So, you know, <laughs> friends, you know, this is just really getting ludicrous when you get down to it. The gentleman didn't have an answer for me. Uh, and and I, I'm actually giving him a scripture. Let's, let's see if we can't um, put a scripture that. Acts chapter 2, those that gladly received his word were baptized. Acts 2.41, read it with me. And they that gladly received his word were baptized. Now, John 12.48, listen to John 12.48 in regard to receiving Jesus. Listen to this. John 12.48, let's listen to that verse. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words is one that, that judgeth him. 
the word I have spoken, the same will judge him in the, in the last day. Did you hear that? He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word. Well, if you receive Jesus' word, you're receiving Jesus. They that gladly received his word were baptized. You see that? That's how it works. You can't receive Jesus without actually receiving his word and being obedient to it. You're on what's the Bible say? Hey, John. Hey. I like your teaching every Sunday. I watch you every Sunday. Well, I appreciate that. But, uh, if you don't tie, how do you keep the church up? Well, the New Testament command is in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, free will giving as you purpose in your own heart. How about that? Well, that's all right. All right. That's, that's Bible. It ought to be all right, shouldn't it? Yeah, I'll take you. All right. Thank you for calling. Well, see, friends, appreciate the caller there. Gave us an opportunity, again, to present how the church gets funded. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul says, If I have given order to the churches in Galatia, even so do you. Paul's giving you information for the New Testament church. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in store as the Lord has prospered them that there be no gatherings when I come. How about that? You purpose in your own heart. Your own what's the Bible say? Uh, good evening. Good evening. Um, I've been watching for uh, quite a few weeks, and I want, I'm kind of confused on something. Okay. I was baptized in, in a Baptist church when I was younger. Mm hmm And... Are you saying that I wasn't saved when I was baptized? Ma'am, uh -huh. I, I am saying that, and I'm going to give you the scripture why. It'll take me just a second here. Would you rather see it or, or let me quote it to you? You can just tell me. All right, Romans 6, 17. The Bible says in Romans 6, 17, God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that I delivered unto you, being then made free from sin, you became the servant of righteousness. Now that verse is telling us that we can't be saved from our sins unless we obey the right form of doctrine. Okay? Let me give that one to you again. Romans 6, 17. You can look it up. Romans 6, 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart. That form of doctrine delivered unto you, being then made free from sins, you became the servant of righteousness. You have to obey the right form to be made free from sin. Listen to this one, John 8, 32. You shall know the truth and the... You remember that verse? The truth shall make you free. If you obey error, you don't get made free. And Baptist doctrine is not truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. All right. Does that help? Well, right now I feel... I'm, I feel... Good evening, everybody. This is What Does the Bible Say? My name is Caleb Robertson. I am a Christian. I am a member of the body of Christ, and this is a live, local television broadcast that we do. The body of Christ puts this program on. I am a member of the body of Christ, and when I have this moment with you at the beginning, I always have to emphasize to longtime viewers and new viewers who are just joining us for maybe the first or couple, time, couple of times, uh, the body of Christ is not a denomination. Now some people might say, well y'all are a denomination, you just don't admit to that. No. We don't have, Christians don't have a man-made structure and hierarchy. I don't have a headquarters. Someone asked me the other day, they said, what, uh, how did they put that? Association. They said, what association are you with? I said, I'm not, I'm not in an association. I said, I'm in, I'm in the body of, I'm in the body of Christ. And that, like, I'm using biblical terms, it's just as foreign to the sectarian folk as it's foreign to me when you ask me things like, what association are you with? It's non-sectarianism. We're trying very hard to promote unity inside of the religious community. And we want, I don't think that we're going to be able to, when I say religious community, I'm talking about people who even look at their Bible or, you know, you go into a building on the first day of the week. But outside of the current religious community, I don't think that we're going to be able to reach non-believers and I know that we're not, because John 17 says so, but let's look at this. John 17, 20 and 21. <clears throat> Jesus said, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. Look, if we're not going to promote the oneness here, believers, one in Christ, then no, non-believers are not going to take us seriously. And really the issue is they're not taking you y'all the sectarians seriously so this broadcast uh it is controversial and we don't deny that 
Jesus was controversial. The apostles were controversial. The prophets and Moses and King David, all these individuals in the Bible were controversial because they were taking stands on what God was actually ordaining to the people. And if you read your Bible in any sense, you're going to see that the rebellious people are going to be put down. And Jesus said in Matthew 15, 13, every plant that my father has not planted, he's going to root up. And these basically modern sects that we have either started in America or they started over in Europe. And I'm talking about Roman Papists and Anglicans, which was King Henry VIII. He started the Church of England. So we're really trying to have unity. Now, just real quick, uh, as we get into it, I like you, and some of y'all like me, and then I say this too. I say I love y'all. I don't just love y'all. I like y'all. And so some people might uh, be curious, and they want to hear about it, and then some people won't care. But you'll notice I didn't do a whole live broadcast for the past month. And that's because my wife was pregnant. We had our baby. Uh, he was born earlier this month, and he actually was not born there. He just had to be taken to the emergency room. Bad breathing when he was born, but he's doing better now. And wife, mama is doing good, so we say we had our baby. Now I'm back. And I will say that's not the broadcast this evening. Uh, precious little thing, even though my Presbyterian, Roman Papist, Episcopalian, Lutheran neighbors would tell me, and my Southern Baptist neighbors would tell me that that baby is depraved. He cries like any other baby. Uh, we're having a good time and we're learning. And so just wanted to share that little bit of our lives with y'all. Baby's here and we're parents. And now somebody says Caleb's going to be talking about his kid every chance that he gets. Well, we'll see how it goes. If you're watching local and you're watching us on Star News, and if you're watching on Sundays, uh, people on Sunday night, they can see us in the Wilson, North Carolina area, Tarboro, and uh, Rocky Mount, North Carolina. They can watch us on WIG TV down there at the bottom. And if you're in Reedsville, North Carolina, you're watching us on Star News. But you can see us on Facebook. You can see us on YouTube. And let's go over here. If you have your cousin Ted over in Wisconsin, you say, Ted, these guys are teaching the Bible on TV, on Star News. And you say, Ted says, I can't see Star News. I'm in Wisconsin. This is what you do. Tell him, get on his phone, laptop, tablet, whatever, anything that can access YouTube, and you type in in the search bar, Johnny Robertson, the purple white banner is going to come up. That's my dad's picture, and right here is the Watch Live icon. And then we have over a thousand videos that you and Ted can watch together, and the playlist where they are very neatly organized. Entire books of the Bible have been taught through What Does the Bible Say, this broadcast. And then we just have topics, reformed doctrine, Calvinism, things like that, a whole playlist dedicated to marriage and divorce, a whole playlist dedicated to the Holy Spirit, and a whole playlist just where debates took place. So all that is neatly organized there for you, and we already said this, we're trying to do all this work to have unity. Somebody says, well, you're trying to champion your own personal opinions. I'm trying to bring the Bible into the conversation because when I went to the local Presbyterian sect here in my area, I didn't go over there and hear Bible and someone says, we know you heard Westminster. No, I didn't hear Westminster Confession. When I went to the local Presbyterian sect, I heard C.S. Lewis the whole time. C.S. Lewis and someone says, well, C.S. Lewis wrote good stuff. Look, they were talking about his sci-fi fiction novels. <laughs> they weren't even talking about uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe or other stuff. They were talking about straight up sci-fi novels. You need the Bible. Then I told you about that local lady. You know, she said, oh, yes, I do my Bible study. She said, my mother just died, and she left me all of her Billy Graham books. That's not Bible study. I'm trying to bring the Bible into the conversation, ending religious division, having unity based on conformity to the New Testament text, Christians only because we're following the Bible only, no creed books, no church contracts, no uh, manuals, what have you, just studying your Bible as often as you can and really being serious about it. If you're local and you want to get in contact with us, my phone number is 276. That's my personal number, 276-806-3641. My email address is calebgrobertson at gmail.com. If you email me, we will put you on the informer list. This is a page and a half Bible article that goes out every Sunday morning. And like I said, uh, people would tell me that my baby is depraved and they would misuse John 6:44 in order to do that. So Caleb G. Robertson at gmail.com will put you on the informer list and you can share it with whoever you think might be interested in it. Now, this is our topic tonight. This is just a jump off. We got another big point in just a moment. 
I gave this, I'd go ahead and put it up there. I got into it with these guys. The first one started out, that's Jim Pence. And weeks ago, he put in the paper, baptism is necessary for salvation. The next week, Gary Hughes comes on, and he says in the paper, baptism is not necessary for salvation. And then the week after Gary Hughes, or just a couple days after Gary Hughes, I got in and said water baptism remains very necessary. I never come up with the headlines. They do that for me. And I gave all three of these to one of my friends locally, who is not a member of the body of Christ. I gave him all three of these, and I said, and they were folded up. And so I handed him three sheets of paper, and I said, this was in the newspaper. I said, I thought you might like to see. And he opens it up, and he goes, in the newspaper? Yes, in the newspaper. Now, here's my point. You watch what does the Bible say. You're in some other state. Are you trying? That's free. I got to write that for free. They turn down, someone says, we don't see in the paper that much. It's because they are turning my controversial stuff down quite regularly. Soft soap, what have you. Somebody said, well, it's the summertime and they're just not worried about the paper right now because everybody's taking trips. I don't know. But I will tell you, they're very controversial at different times. And so there's my thing. It's free, though. Are you trying different outlets wherever you are? Now, some people, they're not even going to try. They're going to say, well, it won't happen. You should just write it as long as you can. Try and then write it as long as you can. In the local paper, we like when we get to have these conversations. Are you trying to do what you can? We will come back to that later on. But this is what we're doing tonight, big time. We're spending our time here. My dad used this a little bit the other night. And for people who are watching on YouTube, you heard the bumper as we were coming on. Mixing the New Testament with the Law of Moses. That's a bad idea that a lot of sectarian people are doing, but here's what I'm doing tonight. Now, I'll play in just a second, but here's my thing. If Creflo Dollar can change, anybody can change. What's he changing on? Give a listen. Here we go. He's going to give you an explanation. Uh, it's a little longer. I don't have a problem letting him clear this out. Go, go ahead and listen to this. I I, um, I want to start off by saying to you that I'm still growing and that, and the, that, teachings that the teachings shared, that I've shared in times past on the subject of tithing were not correct. And today I stand in, in humility to correct some things that I've taught for years and believe for years, but could never under, understand it clearly because I had not yet been confronted with the gospel of grace, which has made the difference. I want a I do want to, I want to take a moment here because we're going to have to show something in just a second. Uh, this is fantastic. Now, somebody, you can say what you want to, and I'm fine with you having your thought. We'll see how this plays out. Uh, somebody commented about this, and they said, well, you know, he told everybody, he said, if, if you got a book that I wrote on tithing and it doesn't line up with this, throw it away. So I've already seen somebody say, you know, he's just doing this so that he can now write a new book and sell a new book. Look, I don't know about that. You know, that's what you think is going to happen. We'll just wait and we'll see. But... I got to say, it's a big deal for somebody to take the stage and come out and say, look, for the past how many years, I've been incorrect. I've been teaching y'all incorrectly. And we're going to start diving in and getting the real picture. That, that is essentially what everybody thinks some, somebody else ought to do. And when we see somebody do it, what should we do? I should say this is very, very good, you know? And I basically say this too. I talked with a guy uh, recently. He's just an acquaintance of mine. He's not in the area. I don't think he's making any headway. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I have an acquaintance of mine who I was talking with, and he used to be Baptist, and he told me in the conversation, he said, Caleb, I don't know if you know this. He said, but I'm not with the Baptist anymore. I said, no, I didn't know that. He said, I now basically view myself as a Reformed Methodist. That's not any better. He's not, <laughs> I don't see how he's making any headway that way. But I will say this about him, uh, he's having a moment where he's willing to leave his particular previous tradition. Now, the tradition you grew up with is huge. And my point is this, 
He's already left behind his growing up tradition, religious sectarian tradition. I like to think that that type of a person maybe can be assisted to get the real truth because Reformed Methodists sure don't have the truth. But sometimes that doesn't mean anything because I have another friend who attended with the Presbyterians for a long time and he moved over just like this other guy. He left the Presbyterians and he joined up with Baptists. And I asked him, well, how'd you decide that? He said, well, the Presbyterians were just as liberal as all get out. <laughs> what? The Baptists, man. They're teaching one saved always. No matter what you do, you can't lose your salvation, which grants what? Any type of liberalism that guy doesn't like. Come on. But here's my thing. Back to Creflo Dollar. Uh, he's coming out, and I think it's a big deal. And, you know, I appreciate the sentiment. I do. And I, I don't mean that in any type of... Uh, ambiguous way. I don't mean that in any type of uh, facetiousness, anything like that, but I do have to show you something that somebody said to me. Give a listen to this. And today I stand in, in humility to correct some things that I've taught for years and believe for years, but could never under, understand it clearly because I had not yet been confronted with the gospel of grace, which has made the difference. I won't apologize, because if it wasn't for me going down that route, I would have never ended up where I am right now. He says, Creflo Dollar says, I won't apologize for it, because if it weren't for all that bad teaching that I did years ago, I wouldn't be where I am right now. And somebody said to me, my producer said before we got going, he said, where I am right now is having a $65 million jet. Oh, that, that's really bad. That's like what we've been telling y'all for years. This is the whole thing about why they have been beating you over the head about uh, will a man rob, rob God? Malachi 3.8, will any man rob God? How have we robbed God? Through your tithes and your offerings. Remember I went down to Bible Way Cathedral in Danville and they had this massive banner. You're going to pay money to have a banner made massive and put on this massive building at Bible Way Cathedral in Danville, Virginia. What are you going to put on it? Jesus loves you? No. Uh, repent and be baptized? Acts 2.38? No. Saved by grace through faith? No, not that. We're going to put Malachi 3.8. Bring into the storehouse tithes and offering. That is all Bible Way thinks about. Bible Way has got the uh, Mr. Lawrence Campbell Sr. He's been driving a Bentley. Back then living in an $800,000 house, which we can basically only imagine has gone up. Yeah, I, I can't imagine that you're going to apologize for where it got you when you're flying around in a $65 million private jet. I can't change that, but, you know, that is something that somebody should talk about. And someone says, well, and I've heard people say this about, not about Creflo Dollar, but their own particular pastor, and they say, well, I just think that my pastor deserves it. I would think that if anybody, obviously Jesus, and we all point to the scripture that says he rode in on a donkey, but then beyond that, the Apostle Paul, if not Jesus, and certainly the Apostle Paul would deserve it, but in 2 Corinthians 11, you find the opposite. He's talking about all the hardship that he's willing to go through for the sake of the gospel of Christ. But you don't have him basically appealing, saying, you know, when am I going to get mine? When's it going to come to me? So we do have to talk about this, but I want to say this as we move on. Look, if Creflo Dollar can change, anybody can change. And I do want to say this too. Let's see where it's going to come up. Someone says, are you saying that Creflo Dollar is that corrupt? No, that's not actually what I'm getting at. My point is this. I'm saying Creflo Dollar is an institution. He is basically on the category of megachurch preachers, right? You look at Creflo Dollar, and then you look at a handful of other people, and they're massive. So I'm saying if Creflo Dollar, with his institution, can make a change, and you rarely see institutions change, then I'm saying anybody can change. And I don't mean that in any type of like, oh, you're mega corrupt and you're awful. No, I'm saying it's a big deal. Now let's go back over here to this one. Then on the side, can you all see that? If Creflo can change, anybody can change. And then I do have to say this to people who are watching in the community, and I fit in here with you, right? Look, if the Apostle Peter can accept rebuke, then who in the world are you? Someone says, well, you're, you know, all y'all do is nitpick. No. And someone says, all y'all do is major in the minors. I sure would like to see this list of majors versus minors. Let me look at something real quick. Someone says, you people, who's you people? 
Christians, <laughs> Christians, non-sectarian Christians, they say, you major in the minors. Well, this is one thing that I major in. There's one body. Y'all don't care about that. The body is the church. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. You might say, well, here's the majors. One body, one spirit is your calling, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Y'all don't major in any of this stuff. Someone says, Caleb, who's y'all? Southern Baptists, Independent Fundamental Baptists, Co-op Baptists, Wesleyans, Methodists, if they have another subsect, I don't know, Apostolics, Pentecostals, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Lutherans. Someone asked me, what faith are you? You might be asking me what Jesus I follow. There is only one Messiah, there's only one faith, and there's only one baptism. And y'all don't teach the truth on that either. It is ridiculous. You know, I were just a couple minutes into this, someone said, you're already getting like worked up. I do, because it is ridiculous, because I'm talking to full-grown adults, and then I'm talking to people too. They would say, Caleb, you need to respect your elders. I sure try, but man, your obvious ignorance of the scriptures is very, very hard to work with. And someone says, well, that's rude. You did it to yourself. You made consistent choices through your life to not know the biblical text, and you made consistent choices to let a false teacher spoon feed you every Sunday morning. That's your call. And if you don't know the Bible, that's nobody's fault but your own. Now, if Peter can accept rebuke, Galatians chapter 2, when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed, Paul said. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were the circumcision. And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? And you know what Peter's got to do? He's got me. He says, Peter, you're living like Gentiles do. So why are you now trying to convince these Gentiles to go back to Judaism, which you left behind? Paul caught Peter in a contradiction. What's Peter going to do? Honesty. Uh, that's, that's inconsistent, and Peter has to change. Look, everybody's going to do it at some time. Now, I want to do this with you, okay? Let's go back and give Creflo uh, a little bit more speaking time. But I, but I will say... In the, in the last 10 years, but not to be gained by two factors. So why is this important? Because religion is sustained by two factors, fear and guilt. And if it's one subject that the church has used for a long time to keep people in fear and guilt, it is in that subject of tithing. And it has to be corrected, and it's got to be corrected now. I may lose some friends. Preachers may not ever invite me no more, but I think I've already been through that, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Go with me. Let me have a moment with that, because he's still going, and we'll come back to it. But he said the two things that basically keeps, he called it religion, and I have to take a moment with that. Y'all, I'm not, like, opposed to saying the word religion. Pure religion, James 1.27. I went door knocking recently, and a woman said religion is the problem. And she was a church going. Religion is the problem. No, James 1.27 counts it as a good thing. What the problem is, is Galatians 5, verse number 20. Look at here. Heresies. Sectarianism. Acts 24, verse number 5. That word, heresies, will be translated sect. Traditionalism. Let me show you one more. Colossians 2.8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. It's not God's religion. Religion's not the problem. It's man-made tradition. It's sectarianism. Someone might say, y'all saying the same thing, but you're just saying it in a different way. No, no. I'm using biblical terms. Y'all aren't. Creflo Dollar, in this sense, is not using biblical terms. There's nothing wrong with religion. But I do want to make a point now. He says the thing that keeps tradition and sectarianism alive, he said, was Fear and guilt. Look, y'all, I recognize, I'm still, I've been on here a while with y'all, but in the big scheme, I'm new with you, okay? My dad has been doing this broadcast for 20 plus years. 
Galatians 5, verse number one, number one. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. In your sect, you don't even get to ask Bible questions. When you ask a question, they say, what you asking that for? You've been watching what does the Bible say? You're just trying to cause trouble. You can take that down the road. You don't even get to ask questions. You don't get to ask questions. You don't get to ask questions, and your pastor will get up on Sunday and say, one church is just as good as another. But when they find out that you're visiting with the actual church of the New Testament, the body of Christ, they say, what are you doing over there? You think you're fixing to start something in here? Y'all don't have any liberty over where you are in your man-made sect. The pastor has everybody underneath his thumb. What you have is you have fear, you have guilt. I am, I'm free in Christ. I am free in Christ and every bit of my confidence is in Christ. I'm saying as far as my being saved and I am a saved individual, I'm a child of God. So you might be listening to Creflo Dollar say, you know, fear and guilt. You might be saying, yeah, I know all about that. I don't know that you have fully recognized it yet. You don't get to ask Bible questions. You have to tow party lines, and you basically have to speak the way Baptists speak. You have to use sectarian lingo, and that's why you don't get to know the Bible. Because if you start actually speaking the way the Bible speaks, you can get in trouble just for using biblical language. Here we go. In our text today, in, our text today in the book of Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, and we're going to begin this, oh, probably two or three or four weeks as we really dig into it now. You don't know it, the last two weeks I've been setting you up for this one. You knew it, right? And some of y'all already know what I'm getting ready to say. You knew it, because the gospel of grace has brought you to that place of understanding as well. But it's just that elephant in the room or the elephant in the body of Christ that needs to be dealt with. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. Let's read it out loud together. Ready? Read. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you're under grace. That's not just a cute little verse of scripture. That's literally, you are not living and you are not conducting your life under the Mosaic law, which tithing is a part of the, of the law. You are not living. You are not uh, conducting yourself under the law. Ever since Jesus rose again from the dead, you have been completely uh, set free from living under that dispensation. Let's pause here, and now let me go to the YouTube channel, okay? Look, let's see. This is the title of this broadcast. That particular one is called Stop. This is obviously my dad there. Stop mixing Moses' law into Christ's law. Tithing. You can look at the production of this one. You can tell it's a bit older than what we do now, okay? So here's my thing. Everybody who's watching, what does the Bible say? And you are in a man-made sect. You're whatever you are, you're Methodist, you're Baptist, you're Pentecostal, you're Apostolic, whatever. Does your particular sect, do y'all tithe? What everybody right now ought to do, as we just watch this video together, this upcoming Sunday, you should go into your sect and everybody, I'm not just talking about, you know, we're going to pick one. We're going to pick Ted and Ted's going to talk to the pastor. Everybody should be asking their pastor, are we going to keep tithing? And then when he says, well, are we going to keep tithing? Why would you ask that? And then they're going to say, you've been watching what does the Bible say? You can say back to him, I heard Creflo Dollar say that we're not tithing anymore. I don't know why, and this is my thing, y'all. You take like these things that people say, and you run, you run with. Like I said, I went over the Presbyterian sect, and they're talking about C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said this: "You should go in, and you should ask your pastor what do you think about what Creflo Dollar had to say." He had a verse. He got up there in front of those people. He's got more than one verse. I watched it. He got up there and he said in front of those people, Romans six fourteen, we're not under the law. And when you talk to your pastor, then ask them, "Do you have a New Testament verse?" For tithing, because Creflo Dollar said in Romans 6.14, we're not under the law. So why are you bringing, let's get the end of it, what he said. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. Let's read it out loud together. Ready? Read. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but you're under grace. That's not just a cute little verse of scripture. That's literally, you are not living 
and you are not conducting your life under the Mosaic law, which tithing is a part of the, of the law. You are not living, you are not uh, conducting yourself under the law. Ever since Jesus rose again from the dead, you have been completely uh, set free from living under that. You take that, you ask your pastor about it, and I, now I want to say this. The gospel of grace, the gospel of grace has brought you to it's that, it's that elephant in Romans chapter 3, read, for sin. I'm kind of bothered now because it's like, you know, y'all, you get on Sunday and you go ask your pastor and you say, I heard Creflo Dollar say, y'all should have been reading this on your own. You know what I'm saying? You should have already come across Romans 614 instead of having to wait on Creflo Dollar to show it to you. And the same thing over here. Y'all should have already been reading your New Testament text instead of having to have Johnny Robertson years ago inform you there's no tithing in your New Testament text. A lot of you folk who you wear your badge and you say, I've been going to Sunday school my whole life. You don't read your Bible. And it's evident. If you were reading your biblical text, then you would have already discovered there's no tithing in the New Testament. And I do want to say this, too. Uh, you know, some of y'all, if you got a, a good memory, you will remember that I did a lesson on, on television on Romans chapter 7. I do have to say, uh, Creflo Dollar is misusing Romans 6.14. It's not just specifically going to be talking about the law of Moses, but it's going to be Galatians 3.19, where it says, if a law, let's see here, where, wherefore then served the law, it was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained in verse number one, 21 is what I want. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. I do agree what he's saying. He's just using that one in particular out of context. But the end result is the same. He's saying you're not living under the law of Moses. Someone says, well now, Caleb, because you said that, I'm confused. Not really. No, you're not. Look at this. Colossians 2.16. I just want to use this passage. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the bodies of Christ. These are all Old, Old Testament elements, Law of Moses elements. And someone says, hey, this is, new. <laughs> this is new to Creflo Dollar. Okay, he wouldn't be using all these passages like you would. Hebrews 9.15. For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Here's Hebrews 7, verse number 5. Here's your tithing, and it points it back to the Old Testament. Verily, they that are the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, that they come out of the loins of Abraham. That's the passage I would have used, but like I said, someone would say back to me, well, Creflo Dollar is new to this idea, and he's getting there. You're right, uh, and I'm fine to give the room while he gets there, but here's one more. Hebrews 10, 9 and 10. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he might establish the second. What's he talking about? He's talking about the covenants. Now, verse number 8, offered by the law. Let's go back over here. You heard him, Romans 6, 14, and I want to let him say this once more. Shall not, have dominion, shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you're under grace. That's not just a cute little verse of Scripture. That's literally, you are not. I want everybody to hear that because that's how people treat the Bible. He says that's not just some cute little saying that's in the text. And anytime people hear something they don't agree with, they say, well... Yeah, they don't really say anything. Same idea over here. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. If you want to be saved and become a Christian, you have to be baptized. That's not just some cute little thing that's in the text. Like Creflo just said, this is the scripture. Same thing that he's making over here. Now, let's go back to our slides, okay? Are you ready for this? There's no doubt that right now, as he said, some people are going to be upset with him. And can I make another point, too? You know, throughout the years that What Does the Bible Say has been on television, years ago, my dad helped a sectarian teacher see the truth. Absolutely. How to become a Christian, 
how to be saved, have your sins washed away, and enter the body of Christ. This man understood it. But the thing that he said to my dad was, he said, Johnny, I can't stop teaching tithes. He said, we won't, he already had like his own sect. He said, we won't make it if I don't keep teaching tithing to these people. Creflo, Creflo Dollar is absolute, absolutely hurting y'all's tithes. Like I said, Creflo Dollar is an institution, and the fact that he's doing this, everybody, and like I say, everybody should have been reading our Bibles, reading our New Testament texts, and we should have already known better without Creflo Dollar having to come in and make a change for y'all. He's making a change for a lot of people, and they say, well, this is what Creflo said, this is what we're doing. But look, he tells everybody in the audience, he says, look at Romans 6.14. And he looks at that text, and he says, you are not under the law, but under grace. And he gives them the correct idea. He says, tithing is an old law element. Let's go back to Hebrews 7, verse number 5, so everybody can just see it again. You say, well, we give tithes and we give offerings. You don't know any Levites. Who is a tithe for? Barely they that are the sons of Levi receive the office of the priest, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. You're not under the law. You don't know any Levites, and you're not an Israelite. You yourself, you say, well, there's other tribes to be uh, a Hebrew from. You're not, you're not the gentleman's name was Walter King, and he was in Reedsville. He learned the truth, Walter King, and he might still watch his broadcast. Walter King learned the truth, and he said to my dad, he said, Johnny, if I, uh, he said, if I give, up, give up on tithing, he said, we won't make it. So, wait, wait. Do you hear what you're saying? Just like I said a moment ago, we should have all read our Bible and seen these passages without Creflo Dollar or any teacher coming in and giving you something that really is very clear. Walter King, I'm saying, says to my dad, if I teach the truth, we won't make it. You are expressing three things. Number one, you value the dollar more than the truth. Number two, you do not believe that God will take care of you. And number three, you don't even think that you're leading a group of people honest and sincere enough to accept the truth with you. And that is what I really think about a lot of the sectarian groups in this area. Your preacher has zero confidence in you, and you really don't care because he gives you such baby food lessons to where you say he's not he's not asking us to do hardly anything and he doesn't keep us accountable for anything it's easy believism tied to once saved always saved you guys have your ticket punched you don't care a thing about it but that is what walter king said if we stop teaching tithing we won't make it well here comes in a creflo dollar and he shows you i'm using hebrew 7 5 you're not tithing to a Levite. So that makes no sense when you say, well, we tithe. You don't know any Levites. You're not from the loins of Abraham. His brethren, the Levites' brethren, out of the loins of Abraham. You are not a Hebrew Jew. You say, I'm Jewish. I'm Hebrew. You cannot prove what tribe you came out of. And then also, y'all, as I would point out, there is my go-to is always Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16, 16 talked about that God would appoint a place that three times in a year all the male Hebrews would assemble. People today, they say, I'm a Hebrew. Number one, you don't know what tribe you're from. Number two, you don't even go to Jerusalem. You say, and then you say, why? Well, why would I go to Jerusalem? You don't even know about the feast days going on in Jerusalem. See what I'm saying? Here's our text. Creflo Dollar comes in and says, Romans 6, 14, y'all are not under the law of Moses, and you're not under the law of Moses. And then if you go back and you listen to the rest of his lesson, and uh, I don't have that much, but I'm saying he will use Matthew 5, 18, and he'll make the point too, y'all, and let's go ahead and make this. I don't know that he would have used this passage, but uh, we know it's there. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 17. Creflo Dollar makes the point, he said, look, he recognizes, he says, this is going to upset some people. Rightfully so. But he says, he said, you want to give 10%? Give 10%. He said, that's your business. He said, I just can't tell you what to give anymore. He said, you want to give 20%. That's your business. Look, a lot of people do hear this idea. They say, I don't have to tithe. And then they just start thinking, I won't be 
charitable, I won't be generous, and really, giving revolves around thankfulness. But he says in 1 Timothy 6, 17, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to dis uh, distribute, and willing to communicate. That is the contribution. Somebody says, well, I, if I did that, I wouldn't be able to do X, Y, Z. There's a lot of American religious folk living in absolute excess, as Luke 16 would say, sumptuousness. So, you find these pastors, let's look at another one. In his lesson, Preflo Dollar will say, now, everybody look at Matthew uh, 5, 17. He's going to make the, same, make the same arguments out of Matthew 5, 17 as he did Romans 6, 14. Think not that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Creflo Dollar, he correctly makes the idea, makes a statement with the audience. He says, look, if Jesus did not actually mission accomplish, then we're still under the law. But then he says to everybody, did Jesus accomplish his mission? Yes, everybody agrees with that. He says, then you're not under the law. It's been fulfilled. Now, some people look at this and they have a hard time with it. And an analogy that we've used in the past is, think about this, the difference between where he says, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill the law. And this is just an idea that we can put into perspective. You may not like the illustration, I think it works okay. The way that we've communicated in the past was we said, think of it this way. A police officer pulls you over and he hands you a speeding ticket. You tear it up. You destroyed it, nothing happened. But if you pay it, now it's out of the way. He did not just come to destroy the law and create lawlessness. He said, I came to fulfill and basically give us the blessings of being in covenant, New Testament body of Christ, having our sins washed away by the blood of the sacrifice. But he does say this. He says, in that process, he removed the law of Moses. Now, he's hitting it. <laughs> and like I'm saying, Gospel preachers who are members of the body of Christ have been saying this for a very, very long time, I'm saying. The, be the beginning of the church throughout history, there would be people accurately teaching the New Testament text. It's there, it's available. Can I make another point with you? This, look, y'all. Someone might say, Caleb can't make up his mind how he feels about this. It's like it is a good moment, but at the same time, it is so mega disappointing. Any one of y'all could have bought a strong concordance, and this is a hardback, so that means Goodwill sold it to you for $2. If you find one that's floppy in a paperback, it's a dollar. Strong's exhaustive concordance of the Bible. You could have looked up tithes, and you would have found out all on your own. As a diligent student of the Bible, you would have found out all on your own the tithing is not commanded in the New Testament text. Tithing is not a Christian practice. It was a Hebrew practice. Tithing. What? Offering, contribution, giving, gifts. What? You think of it in your mind, but you start hunting. What is this? This is a dictionary. You look up the word T section, tithes, tithing. You, you would have recognized all on your own. Without me, without Johnny Roberts, without Creflo Dollar, you would have recognized all on your own. You could have rightfully said, I already knew that. And someone says, well, is that all this is about, is saying you already knew it? Get that dude out of the room, man. We want to have Bible knowledge. Hello? You want to know the text so that you're not abused, which is what people have been. And he said it. What do you call it? Fear and guilt. People been abused in the name of religion, and that's American sectarianism. Now, let's make a transition. A lot of, lot of stuff out here dividing Bible students, let's say it that way. And it's a lot of stuff. But right now we're kind of chiseling away at one of them. Tithing. Can I give you the scripture because we just didn't go there? Like, again, forgive me. Sometimes someone says, Caleb, you like talk about some scripture and you don't go to it. You know, sometimes I just get in having so much confidence in the... <laughs> And the viewers, and I said, they know that already, and some of them don't. 1 Corinthians 16, if someone says, if we don't have tithing, then what do we have? 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. 
Creflo made the correct point about this part also. Uh, upon the first day of the week, let everyone you lay by him in store. He is making the point that you should have it ready to go. And he says, Paul is saying, don't start trying to take up a collection when I get there. And to this day, y'all, Christians that have a better concept of their giving, you could ask a bunch of people, what do you give? I don't know. Just toss whatever they had in their pocket. A one or, one or five or six. He says, make a mental effort. Lay by in store. Don't be trying to do it on the spot. But then he says it here. Where is it? As God has prospered him, you determine what you're going to give. And like we said out of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 17, it is a statement of thankfulness. There's a whole bunch that goes into this, but someone says, if we don't have tithing, what do we have? You have free will contributions. One other one. You could use Romans 16, but then there's also 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7 says, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. You determine what you would like to give. That's what we have. The individual makes the decision. But here's what I want to do. Let's leave that. Creflo Dollar told the audience, he says, everybody open up Romans 6.14. He says, y'all aren't under the law. Everybody seemed to be fine with it. Then in the video, he says, everybody open up to uh, Matthew 5.18. He says, look, Jesus fulfilled the law. If Jesus accomplished his mission, he fulfilled the law, and you're not under the law. And everybody seemed to be fine with that. But here's my thing. Creflo was telling y'all, and you need to ask your pastor on Sunday, are we going to keep tithing? And ask him. Creflo Dollar said we don't have to. Tithe, and then show him, some, show him some Bible. Man, tithing is Old Testament, Creflo said. Psalm 150. If Creflo Dollar keeps following his own line of logic, he's going to be telling people to get rid of their church bands. Come on. That's it. You see it. Everybody sees it. We all saw it before Creflo Dollar said it. You don't have a New Testament text to authorize ten, binding 10% on the people. You, it doesn't exist. You don't have it, but you do it anyway. You misuse your Old Testament text to beat people over the head about money. Now, you don't have a New Testament text that authorizes instrumental music in your worship. But what do you do? You and your pastor, you misuse an Old Testament text from the law. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. And then it'll go on and say stringed instruments. And everybody out there says it was good enough for David. It's good enough for me. You know what else was good enough for David? Tithing to a Levitical priesthood. You're not a Jew. You don't know any Levites. You should not be tithing. And this passage will not work for authorizing New Testament worship. Someone says, we don't have instrument. <laughs> We don't have instrumental music. What are we going to do? Again, you see what I do? Like, I'm, I'm having to, let me talk with my Virginia, North Carolina, and YouTube audience. We have a new audience through WIG TV out in Wilson, North Carolina, and Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. And this is what I'm having to do with a lot of them. Do you see how, and you know how to do it because you do it with your friends. You just don't like what it's done to you. You get a book a chapter and a verse. New Testament, because that's where we live. We live on this side of the cross. Jesus has died and he is raised. And when we say something, we have to back it up with Scripture. You say, Caleb, you sound like an idiot. We all know this. Well, I'm saying when it's done back to you, you don't like it. If we don't have instrumental music, what are we going to do? Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, we will sing together. Because that is all we have authority to do. That's New Testament documentation. That is written by a Christian, written for Christians. Ephesians 5. You could have looked up in your strongest accordance, harp, stringed instrument, organ, trumpet, look for it in your New Testament text and show me in the epistles where they were doing it. See what I'm saying? You could be, a, you could be such a better Bible student. It's unbelievable what some of y'all could do. And some of y'all like, as I say, wearing your badge. Some of y'all like to tell people how knowledgeable you are, and you don't know any Bible. 
Now, let's go back. He's getting y'all, man. It's not me. Creflo is getting y'all. Now, let's go back to our newspaper from the beginning. It applies across the board in so many ways, and this conversation opens up so many conversations. Look at this. Jim Pence, he starts out the conversation. He says, baptism is necessary. And he's pointing it. I'm saying he's pointing it at Southern Baptists in the area and a handful of other people. Gary Hughes comes back and he says, baptism is not necessary. But here's my thing, y'all. Jim Pence wants Gary Hughes to change, but Jim doesn't want to change himself. This is the problem inside the sectarian community. Look at this. Jim will say, keep up now. This ain't hard. It's just some he said, they said. But watch, this is accurate. Jim, in his newspaper article, says, to be saved, the Bible says, to be saved, you need to be baptized. And he will quote a handful of passages. Acts 2.38, Mark 16.16, 16, Acts 22.16. Well, this is what Gary will do. Gary is an independent Baptist. Baptist preacher, independent Baptist preacher. Look what Gary will do. He'll come back and he'll say, well, it doesn't say you're lost if you aren't baptized. Y'all, I have spent a lot of time with Gary Hughes. A lot of time. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And look at what Gary will say. Well, that, does, that text doesn't say he that's not baptized will be lost. It doesn't need to say that. In order to be saved, what does the text say? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Jim gets it. You saw it. You saw the text. It doesn't have to say if you don't do it, you'll be lost. If you want to be saved, believe and be baptized. And Gary says, well, it doesn't say the opposite. Now, look at this, y'all. You're on what does the Bible say? Yes, sir. You, uh, you said there was, uh, we're supposed to be singing spiritual in Psalms and spiritual songs. What's yes. the definition of the word Psalms in that uh, Strong's Concordance? <laughs> okay, let's look at Ephesians 5.19. Now, are That's you... That's where I want to go. That's where I want to go. Okay. Are you saying that we ought to be playing instrumental music? I'm not saying nothing. You're using a strong concordance, and I use it too. What is the definition of the word psalm? Are you trying to tell us that, was what I said incorrect, that we should be speaking and singing? It says speaking to yourselves in psalms. What is the psalm? Okay. Now, I have clearly stated speaking and singing. Do you have a problem with those two words? I, I don't have a problem with nothing. I know what both of them is. That's a continuing sentence. What does the word now, Psalms mean? Give me a talk. A, I'm having a hard time hearing you. If you can do something to help me out, help me out. I said, what does the word Psalms mean? Here's our discussion. Oops. Sir, wait. D5567. Okay, I've got 10 minutes. If you're not going to play ball, I'm advocating from Ephesians 5.19, that all we have authority to do, no one has a problem with this word, singing. No one has a problem with that word, speaking. Are you trying to put instrumental music in there? I'm telling you the word psalm says that it is a music with instruments or a heart. Would they not be mechanical? So now this is the point where I say to the community, this guy doesn't even know which word he wants to use. I do, psalms. Everybody. All you gotta do is pull it up. So here, y'all, this is my thing. This is uh, let me just go ahead and let him go. Y'all, this has been happening for years. I'm talking about years. He's focusing on the word psalm, and the word that he wants is solo. Because everybody runs to this word and they say it means to pluck or do an instrument. Look, y'all, why in these words that are there do we not have the command if it's just so clear? If it's just so out there, why isn't it in the text? And someone says, well, it's because you're using like this super old King James Version. You know, the thing about the modern translations is they usually don't hit the heavy stuff. They just got rid of the these and the thous and the ESTs and the ESTHs. Speaking, no one has a problem with that. Singing, nobody has a problem with that. And that dude doesn't even know what word he wants. Making melody is solo. He doesn't want the word psalmos. He wants solo. You see an instrument in there? I don't. It's not going to be in Colossians 3.16 either. This is my thing. What does the text explicitly give us authority for? Singing. Now, he wants to come in and basically start bringing up the Strongs. Here's my offer back to people. <laughs> Look up 
the church, whatever, however you want to do it, find the New Testament church using instrumental music in their worship. Let's go back over here. Let me build this again for y'all, okay? Creflo Dollar, if we follow his logic, he says tithing is Old Testament. Well, so are all of the passages that you use for instrumental music. Psalm 150. Now let's do this. Jim Pence. Why am I bringing up Jim Pence? Because Jim Pence is a part of the... Y'all start looking into some history. In 1906, a group of people said, we want to start using the piano. And they split off from Christians who said, we don't have authority to use the piano. And for Jim Pence in particular, he is a part of DOC, that is the Disciples of Christ. Look, Disciple of Christ is a biblical term, but they have made it into their sectarian group out of like 1968. They split off because they... <laughs> that sect has a splinter in the 1960s. They splinter off because they start saying, well, we want to have women leading the worship more. And they had a handful of other things going on. But here's my point, y'all. He's a part of the 1906 piano sect. Now, Gary, I'm going to come back to Jim Pence. Gary has the same problem that he's wrestling with Jim Pence over. Jim Pence says, the Bible says in order to be saved, you have to be baptized. Gary responds to Jim Pence, well, it doesn't say you're lost if you're not baptized. But Gary Hughes, being an independent Baptist that he is, he would say the New Testament only commands immersion. This is Michael Weaver, and that is Carlos Lerma. He is now with St. Joe Roman Papist sect in Martinsville, and he is now with the Martinsville Lutheran sect, Michael Weaver is. And so what Gary Hughes would say is the New Testament only commands immersion. And he'd go to Romans 6, he'd go to Colossians 2. And they would say back, well, it doesn't say not to sprinkle, Gary. And that's Gary's own argument that he used on Jim right back to him. Now let's go over to Jim. I'm using the same argument to Jim. Jim, everybody who's a part of the 1906 piano sect, the New Testament only tells us to sing in Ephesians uh, 5.19 or Colossians 3.16. Jim Pants is going to come back and say, it doesn't say not to. All of y'all are doing it. That's why I said Creflo Dollar is about to help us all across the board. Tithing, Creflo Dollar says, out the window. Why? It's an Old Testament principle, Old Testament command. Now, same thing with the instrumental music. Same thing with people who are fighting against immersion. And then again on the instrumental music. Okay, you want what does the Bible say? You're on live. Hey, Kale. Hey. You are right. Songs do not mean that the museum is the main music. Okay. You're absolutely correct. Well, I think if we just stick with what the text says, and that's what we're going to get. Speaking to yourself in Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and then he just... You are right. Singing. I don't know what this guy is talking about, but it really doesn't indicate music. Meaning putting the instrument in the museum. Well... I appreciate you calling in, and I, I, you know, we're seeing what the text says. You and I, I would say, are agreeing with the text. We're agreeing with what the Bible says. You know, we're not really agreeing that's with the right. text. We're agreeing with what the Bible says, and so I think that's what the gentleman's having a hard problem with. Is folk have the yeah, tradition? Yeah, I'm listening to you. Really enjoying. All right, I appreciate it. You have a good night. Good night. Okay. Now I think everybody sees what we're saying. This is how people do their arguing. Well, the Bible doesn't say not to. Well, Creflo Dollar helped y'all out with tithing, but I'm saying if we follow his line of reasoning, we're going to get rid of instrumental music too. The church bands are going to go out. But also, we have now seen that that line of reasoning is what people do when it comes to how to obey the gospel. Gary Hughes doesn't like it in Mark 16, 16. Why? Because he's independent Baptist. It doesn't jive with his tradition because Baptists just say you easy believe and that's it. And these folk... They have the tradition of sprinkling or, excuse me, pouring water on their baby. So when you look at Romans 6 and Colossians 2, that doesn't jive with their tradition. Well, we got to get the tradition out of here, Colossians 2, 8, and we got to start having what the Bible says. Now, let me close out this way. Why is it that teachers won't change? I only got five minutes, four minutes. Why is it that teachers won't change? Pride. If any man teach otherwise, this is 1 Timothy 6, 3 and 5, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, 
even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Why is it some people, when they are presented with the Bible truth, book, chapter, verse of the New Testament, it's contrary to what they grew up with in their tradition, they still won't change. They're proud. That's all there is to it. And as we go out, let's just talk about this with each other, okay? I said it at the beginning of the broadcast. I love you. People who call up and they be ugly with us, we love them too. We pray for them. And if we know who you are, I say this too. I had somebody talking to me not too long ago, and it's some people who didn't really like me. And I said, you know, if you hear them talking trash about me again, I said, you don't, I don't expect you to like defend me. I said, but you can tell them, you know, Caleb probably prays for you by name. And it's probably true. Caleb, how dare you talk about pride to anybody? Wait a second. Y'all are the one who believe in man-made creeds. You believe that your champions, your particular group of folk, you say, man, they hit the nail on the head. Good for them. And I'm saying, I follow the Bible, no men. Someone says, it's impossible to go without influences. I recognize that. But when I find that the Bible is contradicting people who would have been my teachers or influences, I have to side with the Bible. I believe the Bible's right. And I don't say that I'm right in my ideas. I'm just showing book, chapter, verse, and saying, what else can that mean? Y'all are the ones out here saying that your church is the right church, because y'all say, my church. I'm saying that Jesus' church is the only church. You don't, you're not even in the church. You're in a sect. There's only one church in the New Testament, and I'm saying it's Jesus' church. He died for it. Y'all are the ones who are out here saying that large numbers has to mean you're doing something right. Well, if we were doing something wrong, I don't think we could have this many people. <laughs> Same thing Mormons say, man. But I'm the one encouraging small group studies. Find five serious people to study the Bible with, and y'all seriously study the New Testament together. You don't have to have a 500,000 people. Y'all are the one promoting seminaries to get worthless PhDs, and I say just read your Bible every day and try to use it in accordance when you can, and you will get there. Mark 12, 37 says, Common man heard Jesus gladly. One more, y'all are the ones worshiping your pastor. I'm not a pastor. I am just like I say here, just Caleb, I'm a brother in Christ, or I'm your neighbor. Matthew 20, 25, and 26, Jesus called them and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and that they are great, exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you. I don't want anybody under my thumb. I don't want to have to shape anybody, mold anybody. I want you, Galatians 5, 1, to be free in Christ. That's what we're doing this broadcast for. Less division, less sectarian pride. That's what I want. Less sectarian pride, less partyism. If you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Galatians 5.15 and then verse 26. But Paul says, and we'll say this as we go out, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Less partyism, less division, less sectarianism. Just one church, Ephesians 4, one faith, one baptism. My phone number is 276-806-3641. Email is calebgrobertson at gmail.com. Email me. We'll get you on the informer list, page and half Bible article every Sunday. Tell your friends and cousin Ted about what does the Bible say on YouTube. We love y'all. We do. We're praying for you. Please, if you're in a praying position, pray for us. God bless you. Have a good night. Keep asking what does the Bible say.